Hello everyone, welcome to the crappy intro video with the crappy MacBook camera. So last time I told you we we're going to talk about Chomsky hierarchy. Well, we're not going to talk about that because today is the day I tell you about the semantics of PEG and CFG. So, so far I've given you the intuition about uh, parsers and in particular PEG parsers. Uh, today I get to tell you exactly what the meaning of a grammar is, or at least make it more precise. I'm also going to explain to you the difference between PEG and CFG, because I've alluded a couple of times that those are two very different formalism, and today we really uh, zero in on the differences. So this is a long video, don't be discouraged, there's a lot of content in there. Uh, it was quite difficult for me to make actually, I don't think I'm a, I'm a great orator. Uh, I had to do a lot of editing to remove the crappy mouse noises and uh, all the uh and the ah uh. so i hope at least that you learn something and next video is going to be short see ya so over the past few lessons we've learned that a grammar is the formal definition of a language a language is a set of sentences potentially infinite a parser recognizes a sentence in language and extracts the syntax tree that matches that sentence and a parsing tool generates or runs parsers. So we've seen two grammar formalism, context-free grammars and parsing expression grammars, and we've seen some notations for them. And we've said that notations are not that important. What's important is to map the notations to a model, and using that model, then we can interpret the grammar. And that's, that's what we're going to do today. So we gave an example of JSON, and the only thing that's really important here is that you remember that non-terminals are the thing that we define and terminals are typically either characters or tokens or things that have no definition cannot be expanded further. So what's the model for a context-free grammar? Classically, a context-free grammar is modeled as a tuple of four components. So there's a set of non-terminals, there's a set of terminal symbols, alphabet, there's a set of production rules, and production rules are defined as follow. So a production rule has a non-terminal, you know, that's the left part, and the right part is a string of symbols where each symbol is a terminal or a non-terminal. So it's, you know, we use the clean star, so it's zero or more, and if it's zero, we typically note that as epsilon for empty. And finally, we have the starting symbol, S. The starting symbol tells you where to start the parse. It tells you, you know, what, what's the main important thing in the grammar. So in the JSON example, the starting symbol is the value, because we just want any JSON value. We don't care if it's a string literal, a number, etc. Okay, so you might have noticed that this format for production rules is not exactly what we had in our notations. So our notations have these symbols for repetition, optionality, and they have choices. So the first step, and we've done this before, is to eliminate these symbols by replacing them with recursive non-terminals. So for instance, this whole thing here is T pair here. And you can see this is recursive because T pairs include pairs and pairs include T pairs. So there's recursion there. The next step then is to remove all these choices, right? Because the production rules say that the right hand side can only be a string of symbols. It can't have choices. So when we have a choice, for instance, here, we are going to replace it with as many production rules as there are choices. So there's one for the first possibility and there's one for the second possibility. That's not too complicated. So the language defined by context free grammar is the set of all sentences that can be derived from the rules. What is such a derivation? Well, we start from the start symbol and we replace it by one of its right hand side. And we keep repeating this process. So at each step, we have a string of symbols, terminals, non-terminals. We will pick one non-terminal and we will replace it by its definition. And when I say definition, I mean one of its right hand side. It's just very long to say that, so I'm going to say definition. And we keep doing this, these replacements 
until we only have non terminals in the string actually it's terminals until we only have terminals left in the string and you can pick any non terminal order does not matter and so this defines the language a sentence is in the language defined by the grammar if the sentence can be derived from the grammar this is not a parsing algorithm we don't use this for parsing so this approach to semantics is called uh, generative because we use the grammar to generate a set of sentences you could also say it is extensional because we explicitly list sentences so let's give an example of derivation we start by the value of course so we need to pick one of its right hand side so we're going to say we want an object object is just a single non-terminal so we pick its right hand side is only one and you see here i've highlighted the terminals in red so we still only have one non-terminal here we have two possible uh, right hand sides we're gonna say we want some pairs again we put there replace it uh this time we actually have a choice right so we have these two we're gonna start by left always and so a pair is gonna be replaced by this the first two items are terminal so there's nothing to do and then we have a choice again let's replace value this time say we want a number and finally we get to the last non-terminal t pairs and we're gonna just replace it by nothing because that's one of the possibilities and we don't want uh, more than one pair so we end up with this at the end which is made only of terminals so mission accomplished if your language used characters instead of tokens this process would continue and you would uh, generate you would derive one specific string literal here and one specific number here which raises an interesting question because there's of course an unlimited number of string literals and unlimited number of numbers and there's also even when using tokens an infinite number of json values so the derivation process you really have to think of it as a criteria as a mathematical construction so a sentence is in the set is in the language defined by grammar only if it has a derivation if it doesn't have a derivation it cannot be in the language but you cannot enumerate the whole language because in many cases the language is infinite so that's it for cfg now let's talk about pegs I am not going to explain to you the precise formal semantics of peg. We've written a bunch of parsers which effectively use the peg semantics. And you will remember that they had one function per non-terminal and these functions call each other recursively. So that's why it's called a top-down recursive descent parser. It's top-down because we start from the what would be in CFG, the starting non-terminal, which is the biggest thing in the grammar. What's more interesting is that we can they sugar the expression in peg uh, into a form that is effectively similar to the production in CFG. There's only one exception, and that's the look ahead operators. We'll actually talk about them later in this video, but for now, let's ignore them. And so if we convert to this form, then we can compare peg and CFG. First though, let me emphasize something. CFG are generative, which means that this, their semantics is given by constructing the language set from the grammar through derivation. Peg on the other hand are recognition based. So what that means is that a sentence is in, in the language defined by a peg grammar only if it's recognized by the recognizer for the grammar. So if we were to formalize peg, what we would be doing essentially is formalizing the recognizer for the grammar. So these are two very different mathematical approaches and I can't say that one is better than the other. CFG is easier to express in the language of mathematics, so it's some people say it's a bit more elegant. Peg, on the other hand, has the advantage that the formalization is very much related to the, the practice. Uh, that's almost your parsing algorithm there. So the big difference. In CFG, choice is unordered. That's the property that in derivations, we can pick any non-terminal we want, remember? It doesn't matter. In PEG, on the other hand, 
choice order. So when we are matching, and remember in PEG, it's recognition based. So this matching always involve an input that we are testing. And the first matching choice alternative is always the correct one. So once we've seen that there's one alternative that matches, we'll validate that choice and we will never come back to change it. So this has consequences for the parsing algorithms. So let me give you an example grammar here. So you can see that rule A equals rule B, and this is either X, Y or X, and then there's Y, Z after B, and our input is X, Y, Z. In PEG, this will not match because you start matching B and then B will match X, Y because you know it's there. But then you come back and they want another Y and it's not there, there's Z. If you had matched X, they would have worked, but when you're matching B, you don't know that. You just look at the start and you say, well, it's X, Y, and that's it. You never come back to try something else. In CFG, on the other hand, if X, Y doesn't work, we can pick X. And I cannot give you the mechanics of that right now because it depends on the algorithm and there are different algorithms. But uh, let's just say that in CFG, this would have worked. So this property of PEG, where uh, it will only pick the first choice, uh, I've called that the single parse rule. And since repetitions can be disaggregated to choice, it also impacts them. And it impacts them in the sense that they become greedy. So if you take this language, this uh, grammar, sorry, the language is defines it is empty. It will never match anything. The reason is, well, this should be the languages, the language of uh, A strings, strings made only of A. But this will consume all the A's and there will, there will not be any A left for uh, that guy there. And you can see that a bit more precisely if you unsugar it. And note that regular expressions do not suffer from this problem, even though they use the same notations. Regular expressions very much work like context-free grammars. So another way to look at this difference in choice ordering is to look at the way the parsing algorithms for PEG or CFG backtrack. So I've written this grammar is the same as last time, except I've added V here for the sake of the example. So you're matching X, Y, Z, and you're starting here. Uh, you're trying to match V, but there's no V, so it fails. Then you're trying to match X, then Y, and that's there, so it succeeds. So you skip this, this is never tried. You go there, try to match Y, but it says Z, so it fails. And that's it. Now, for a CFG, you would start the same way. So try V, it's not there. Try X, Y, you succeed. Try Y, it's not there. But then you can figure it out. Oh, it's not there, so I could just use X. And then retry, and it would succeed. Actually, that's now not how CFG parsing algorithm work, OK? But this is just to illustrate the semantics. You could devise a parsing algorithm that works like this. It would have exponential time complexity, so it's a terrible idea. It gives you the idea that in CFG, choices are not set in stone. Okay, you can always consider something else. Whereas in, in PEG, it's like, okay, I've seen some input that matches this, it's over. The choice is locked in. So I almost forgot. Why is this called vertical backtracking in this vertical plus horizontal backtracking? Well, you remember when you wrote a parser, backtracking was the process of undoing the progress we'd made because we failed to match an input and going back up to the previous choice or the previous repetition. But in this model, we desugar repetition to choices. So there's only choices. So that's the case here. We try to match V. Since it fails, we go back up to the choice and we try the next alternative. You have to imagine that it, instead of V, it could be a non-terminal, and so you actually try to parse a bunch of stuff, you make some progress, and then, oh, I can't, I can't make it work, so just erase everything and go back up. So that's vertical backtracking, because the only way you're going to skip to the next alternative if, is if something here fails. Now, CFG also has vertical backtracking, right? Yeah, v doesn't work, we skip to the next alternative. But then this succeeds, and then we go there, and this fails. Well, then we can hop back in and pick the next alternative there. So that's horizontal backtracking because uh, Y here is a sibling of the, the choice. So that's basically 
a different way of saying what I've told you before. So far, we've said that peg have the problem of prefix capture. So it sounds like CFG are always better. But there is a flip side to that, and that flip side is called ambiguity. So by construction, peg cannot be ambiguous. And that's because you take the first thing that matches. So there cannot be any possible ambiguity. CFG, on the other hand, uh, do suffer from the problem of ambiguity. And we'll see an example shortly. But they do not have prefix captures. So remember that this is the grammar I use as an example for prefix capture. So a peg would match P as x, y, and then it could not match any subsequent y. So supposing the input was x, y, z. Here is an example for ambiguity. Here the issue if, again, the input is x, y, z, a peg would match B as x, y, and then it would match C as z. So this will work, right? This is what you wrote here. And that's the only possible parse, the only correct one. Now for a CFG, you don't know if you should match B as X, Y and C as Z, or, so that's the first one here, or if you should match B as X and C as X, Y, the second one here. For a recognizer, that's not an issue. If there's two ways that the thing can be correct, in the end it is still correct and the sentence is in the language. But it is a problem if you want to generate an abstract syntax tree. Which mode should you use? This one or this one? It also has important consequences for the performance of parsing algorithm. They deal very poorly with ambiguity, the parsing algorithm for CFGs. Let's talk a bit more about performance. So the best parsing algorithm for CFG run in a complexity of n cubed and n is the length of the input. However, most of the grammar that you're going to write realistically, their uh, major parts are deterministic. This is a term that we'll define later in the course, but know that most of the grammar should be deterministic. And these parts can be parsed in on, so that's significantly better. Now, for peg, the regular algorithm, so that's the way we wrote the JSON uh, parsers, that is exponential, in theory. However, it's almost impossible to write a true exponential peg grammar. Like, it's it's really a challenge. And uh, by truly exponential, I mean like OX exponent N. It is, however, easy to introduce an inefficiency when doing one particular thing that, unfortunately, we have to do often. And that's defined in the syntax of infix operators. A classical example of that is, of course, arithmetic operators. So plus, minus, times, divided by, modulus. But that's the only big pitfall for peg grammars. Otherwise, it should most of the time parse linearly. So let's see an example of an inefficient peg. And this is a grammar for arithmetic operators, precisely. So uh, when I was preparing the slides, I wrote this and then I realized I hadn't, I hadn't told you about associativity and precedence, which is a basic concept in parsing. I think you're familiar with this concept, but in case some of you are not, here's a recap. Associativity uh, means how you group terms when you are faced with binary operators. Uh, so there's left associativity, you group everything to the left, so one will plus two, and then it's going to be one plus two plus three, and this whole thing plus four. Right is the opposite, you group to the right. Precedence is about the binding power of operators. And of course, in arithmetic operators, we know that multiplication and division is more binding than addition and subtraction. So if you write one plus two times three, then you should group two and three together because that operation is going to be performed first. So that's associative in, per in precedence. What is important here? This is not even a good arithmetic grammar because this is a grammar that is actually right associative. You see there's a recursion there and the recursion is on the right. Let's take it from the bottom. So n is a sequence of digits, so that's just a number. p is for product, and that's going to be a number times a product. If I have 1 times 2 times 3, I'm going to have 1 times 
two times three grouped together. So right associative, which is not what we want. And the reason this is right associative is because PEG does not support left recursion normally. And we'll talk about that later also. Still, this is a good example for uh, an efficiency in the PEG. So why is this inefficient? Well, assume you want to parse the number 42. So that's N. But the starting symbol of the grammar is S. Also assume that we implemented this the way we did before. So there's going to be a function called parse n to uh, parse the numbers. And the question is, how many times will this function be called? So you might want to pause the video and try to think how the parser would work and how many times this function would be called. Uh, you might even want to try to implement it yourself. It's a very small grammar. OK, now for the solution. It's nine times. Why nine? Well, if you uh, parse the product, you're going to call the function once here. It will match. Then you will realize that there's no multiplication sign. So you will go there, parse it again, then realize there's no division sign, and then go there and parse it again. So three times. Each time you uh, attempt to match p, you will attempt to match n three times. Now, when you attempt to match a sum, you will attempt to match a, uh, a product, then realize there's no plus, do that again, realize there's no minus, and then do that again. So three times you will attempt to match p, and each time you attempt to match p, you attempt to match n three times, so three times three, nine times. In general, uh, we have such a, an expression tower, I've called it. If you try to match the bottom, it's going to be called proportionally to p plus one exponent l, where L is the number of precedence level, so here we have one, two precedence level, and P is the number of operators at each level, so here we have two plus one, right? P plus one, exponent L, so two plus one equals three, exponent two, that's nine. And if you take a language like Java or C, well, that's thousands of call to this uh, function here, and uh, that's not fun, it will do bad things to your performance. So what is the solution? In Otten, you would write the grammar like this. And what this says is that P, the product, has the number as an operand, and the operators are times and divided. So in case you're wondering, infix means it's a binary operator, and the operator is in the middle of the two expressions. The sum, on the other hand, has the product as an operand, and it has plus and minus as the operators. This is correct in Otten. It's even left associative. And what it does under the wraps is that it essentially rewrites the grammar to this here on the right. And you can see that now we're only parsing P once, each time we're parsing S, and we're only parsing N once, each time we're parsing P. And the operations become suffixes, which are matched zero or more times. Now, that is good for performance, but you might be wondering about the parse tree, because if you generate a parse tree directly, this will not give you a nice parse tree. Basically, the parse tree will be a list. You will have the first item and then a list of suffixes. And the answer is that for Atten, it's not an issue. Because in Atten, first, we don't build a parse tree. We build an abstract syntax tree. And we always build it explicitly, which means that you have to supply functions that will create the nodes. Okay, And using the left expression, you need to supply the function here. And this function will take the two operands and will let you build the node for multiplication, for instance. Now, if you're using another peg parsing tool, typically the solution will be to write it like that, get a parse tree, and then rewrite the parse tree. So speaking of performance of peg and of peg parsing tools, something that's really popular is called packrat parsers. Packrat parsing is an optimization technique for peg parsers. And it's based on a single parse rule. So remember, a single parse rule says that once a choice alternative matches at a given position, we will never revisit that choice. And that makes memoization of results very easy. So each time you parse a given parsing expression at a given position, that's a unique pair. And you know that the result of that will always be the same. The, the string that is matched at that position is always going to be the same, or it, it will always fail. So a packrat parser is a peg parser with memorization. The thing is, 
I've done practical experimentation. Other people have done experimentations as well. And what we've shown is that backward parsing is typically slower, right? Because memorization, you need to access memory and the access to memory can be quite slow. That is something we'll discuss when we discuss optimization. Uh, and so there are two mitigating factors. These tests were done with Java mostly. And so maybe if your language is very slow, something like Python, maybe JavaScript, although JavaScript is a VM, so it should be fast, then it is possible that memorization values or something. So I haven't done these tests, so I'm not very confident to say it's always slower, but if you're using a reasonably fast language, it's a bad idea. What I think the bigger problem is, is that a lot of these tools do not give you proper utilities to define your infix expression. And so if you do not use memorization, it's going to be very slow as soon as you have these uh, infix expression in your grammar. So something we have not yet talked about is expressiveness. And in particular, the set of languages that can be expressed with PEG and the set of languages that can be expressed with CFG. So in fact, there are PEG grammars that define languages that you can define with a CFG. And the prime example of that is this language here. It's a language in which you have a certain number of A followed by the same number of B and the same number of C. So it doesn't matter which number it is, it just has to be the same number of each of these letters to be in the language. This is quite an interesting example. And in fact, we'll come back to this example and we will show that we can prove that this language does not have a CFG. There are also CFGs that define language that cannot be defined with PEG. And the classical example here is the palindrome language. So a palindrome is a word that reads the same from the start to the end and from the end to the start. Here we only use two characters, A and B, but the same principle applies uh, independently of the number of characters. It's quite interesting to try to see if you try to interpret this grammar as a PEG, how does it work? So I encourage you to try this with this input string. And in fact, you can use smaller input string. You can try it on one A, two A's, three A's, and you will see that it doesn't work. And it's quite an interesting experiment to do because it's not very intuitive, right? We read this and you're like, well, yes, well, this is obvious. And in fact, for PEG, it doesn't work, which shows that in a sense, CFG sometimes is more intuitive. So another issue is that traditional PEG does not end all left recursion. So there is a very classical left recursive grammar just defining a language of a repetition of A's. If you wanted, you could extend the PEG formalism with semantics for left recursion. It's quite difficult to do in the sense that it's hard to come up with a semantics that's both intuitive, so consistent with the rest of the semantics, and implementable. If you're interested, that's something I try to do in my thesis, so that's there. The question is, do we even need left recursion? And I don't think so. There are two big use cases of left recursion. First is repetition, and we have a, an operator for that, so we don't need it. And the second use case is the syntax of infix operators. And for that, we have left expression. I've never seen any other need for left recursion. So no problem. Finally, we come to look ahead operators. And these are not very difficult. So basically, you have the simple look ahead operator, which takes another expression. So this could be a sequence, a choice, whatever, a non-terminal. And it succeeds if that expression succeeds. But it does not consume any input. So think about when we implemented the parsers. This means that the input position stays the same after the function. The net predicate, on the other hand, only succeeds if the expression fails. It also does not consume an input. Now, in the PEG formalism, normally, you can define the look ahead as a double negation, right? Because if, if it does not, not fail, then it succeeds. In practice, uh, this tend not to work in tools. It certainly does not work in Atten. The issue is that when you have not x and x succeeds, then NUTX will discard the parse tree that are emitted by X. And so when you do not NUTX, then you cannot retrieve this parse tree. You could implement it to work that way. The thing is, there's no point. Nobody wants to do this in practice. Finally, a few adds and end on peg parsing. Peg parsing have been traditionally associated with scannerless parsing, which is parsing without a lexer. 
It turns out that having order choice and look ahead is quite useful at the lexical level. In CFG, there are things that you just cannot do with the formalism. And one of these things are reserved words. Those are keywords and basic uh, type words. So to take the Java example, int is a reserved word, true is a reserved word, public is a reserved word. So you cannot have variables that are named public or int. And this you cannot do with CFG. That being said, having a separate lexer can still be advantageous, even with parsing expression grammar. It does make error handling a bit easier. Having a separate lexer can also be advantageous for performance. And that's because a scannerless parser spends most of its time at the lexical level. So if you can go and write an optimized lexer, that's going to improve performance a lot. And often, the lexical syntax is simple enough that it is in fact doable without too much effort. Another advantage of PEG is that because they're based on the semantics of recursive descent parser, they're easy to extend. And we actually showed that, right? We wrote some combinators and you can add your own combinators. And that's very easy because the semantics map straightforwardly to code. For CFG, it's not that easy. So I realize this has been a dense video, but let's briefly summarize what we've learned. So we've learned about PEG semantics and PEG semantics are intentional, which means that the set of sentences, the language, is defined by a predicate, which is basically what does a recognizer for the grammar match. The semantics are similar to unwritten top-down recursive descent parser, such as those that we wrote together. If you take parsing expression, they can be disfigured to look like CFG production. The only thing that you cannot disfigure are the look-ahead operators. And finally, the most important thing about PEG semantics is the single parse rule, which is that if you take a single parsing expression or a single disugar non-terminal, and you try to match it at a given input position, it's always going to either succeed in the same way or fail. On the other hand, CFG semantics are extensional. For CFG, the language is a set of sentences where the sentences are obtained by derivation. So we use the production rules of the grammar to derive these sentences and list them explicitly. So the key difference between PEG and CFG semantics is that PEG has order choice. And this is just essentially the same as a single parse rule. Uh, you could also say that this choice is deterministic. CFG on the other hand has unordered choice or non-deterministic choice. A consequence of that is the way that conceptually these grammar backtrack. And what's really meant here is that in PEG, once you've matched one choice alternative, you never reconsider that choice. It is locked in, where in CFG, you're always considering every possible choice. There are also some issues that derive from this distinction, and is that PEG suffers from prefix capture and CFG suffers from ambiguity. The set of languages that PEG and CFG define or can define are disjoint. In practice, both are expressive enough. So the examples we had for things that are exclusive to one or the other is that PEG cannot define the palindrome language, but CFG cannot define the letter repetition language, the AN, BN, CN language. Something to keep in mind is that with CFG, you probably need a separate lexer. With PEG, you don't need it. You might want it sometimes. Talking about performance, the best parsing algorithm for CFG run an ON cube, but the biggest part of most grammar is deterministic, and that means that it can be parsed in linear time. For PEG, the algorithm is potentially exponential, but in practice, it is largely linear. There's only one thing you need to pay attention to, and that's the syntax of infix expressions. There's also the Packrat parsing algorithm, which is linear, but remember that in practice, it is often slower if you do not have an issue with your infix expressions. So say you start a new project, and you're free to choose the parsing technology you want to use. Should you go with PEG or with CFG? The reality is that both formalism are good enough, and that's not what you should use as a criteria. What you should use as a criteria is the tool that you are going to use. So first, have a look at what's available for the language that you're going to work with, and it can help to list your requirements explicitly. That can be a bit difficult, but I hope that after following these lectures, you'll be able to know a few things to look for. So. In this presentation, I reused quite a few examples and also a few figures from my PhD thesis, which was about peg parsing and the creation of the autumn tool. And if you want to know 
more about PEG in particular and also a bit about CFG in quite some depth, then I encourage you to check it out. That's it for today. Next time, we'll finally see what Chomsky hierarchy is, and I promise this will be a much shorter video. See you next time. Take care.